Okay, I guess we can get started. Um, so I'm very happy to introduce today's talk for the networking channel. It will be a panel and the topic will be on human centered networking. And the uh, motivation for this panel is that, uh, you know, sometimes as engineers, we focus a lot on technical problems without thinking about how our works uh, affect people or how it could affect people, you know, the kind of the human and societal context of what we do. Um, so in this panel, you'll we'll hear about interesting research problems in this space, you know, key accomplishments and also techniques to help enable you uh, to do work in this space as well. And uh, we have an amazing panel with true experts in this space. We have Elizabeth Belding, a professor in the Department of Computer Science at the University of California, Santa Barbara, who has over 20 years of experience in wireless networking. She has used her talents to revolutionize internet access in marginalized communities in developing regions and after natural disasters. We have Curtis Hemerl, assistant professor at the University of Washington, recipient of the MIT 35 Under 35 Award, a world expert on using technology for poverty alleviation, repairing ecosystems, and environmental sustainability and conservation. We also have Adishwar Seth, associate professor from IIT Delhi, founder of Graham Vani, a social entrepreneurial venture to enable development of rural areas. He works extensively on monitoring biases in policymaking and preventing disempowerment effects of new technologies. We have Srinivasan Keshev, the Robert Sansom Professor of Computer Science, Sloan Fellow, Royal Society, a fellow of the Royal Society of Canada, a professor at University of Cambridge. And he has a very extensive history of providing internet access to the impoverished and reducing carbon footprints, forest conservation, and energy sustainability. And finally, the chair of the panel, Ellen Zagura, Fleming Professor in the School of Computer Science at Georgia Tech, chair of ACM SIGCOM, member of the executive board of the Computing Research Association, she has done extensive work on computing for social good, including work in Liberia with Native Americans in Southern California and with disadvantaged residents in Atlanta. So here's all their pictures. Um, and uh, you know, be before we start, I, I wanted to mention that um, the networking channel is, a, uh, is more than just a single talk. This channel comprises a series of talks. We have talks every other week. They are free of charge and open to everybody. And we wanted to encourage you to attend all of them. Uh, this talk is gonna be the last one of the season and we're gonna take a little break for the holidays. And we'll start again about six weeks from now on January 19th. Uh, so with that, we can get started. Uh, we wanna encourage all of you to participate. Uh, we want this to be you know, an easygoing and you know, informal panel. Uh, you can post questions here on the Zoom. We're also gonna have a link to our Slack workspace. We're gonna post it in the chat in a few minutes. Uh, where you can also post questions and you can continue after the talk as well. We're gonna kind of try and continue the conversation there as well. Um, so with that, I'll turn things over to the chair, Ellen, who's gonna begin the panel. Thank you, Matt. Um, and thanks to all the organizers of the networking channel. I, I've been aware that it was happening. I confess I haven't um, uh, yet had taken the opportunity to watch any of the, um, uh, or participate in the previous events, but, but now that I know about it, I will, um, uh, take a closer look. So I think it's a wonderful thing to do for the community. And I especially like the um, way that it uh, uh, draws on people from many parts of the world and, and uh, researchers from many parts of the world um, to get to get a uh, more diverse set of perspectives. Um, and I think this is also a panel that hopefully is on the on the diverse perspective um, uh, axis. So um, Matt, I think you could stop sharing your screen um uh and um i i i'm going to start with a provocation those introductions were sufficiently um uh, good that i'm i'm going to give each of the i was going to have the panelists introduce themselves i give you a minute to think about um what you might what you might say because you were also going to highlight give an example of a project you've been involved in i think that's still worth doing um 
Uh, also, if people can't match up the prior pictures with your current pictures, that will give them a chance to do so, Curtis. Um, all right, so uh, I'm gonna I'm just share. Uh, oh, oh, and one more thing. Um, uh, this echoes what Matt said, but I want to reinforce it. Please feel free to put questions into the Q and A during the panel. Um, I'll watch that if I think um, that. Uh, the question integrates nicely with where we are in the discussion. I'll, I'll put it in. If not, um, we will reserve time at the end for Q&A. So, so feel free to put in things that both are responsive to what you're hearing um, in the moment uh, and also things that you may want to know um, that we could come to when we get towards the end. Um, and okay. Uh, so let me, let me share my screen. And this is just a meant to be a kind of brief, um, just a, a brief, a brief provocation. And I'm not gonna bother to um, turn this into slideshow mode. I think you all panelists could confirm that they can see that pretty well. I appreciate it. Okay, thank you. So, um, okay, so human-centered networking, what does this mean? I hope that's one thing that, one thing you'll take away from the panelists, some, some understanding of what, what that might mean. It's obviously not, gonna it doesn't have a, a fixed definition or a, uh, so so but but that you'll have some understanding so I, I wanted to start with this figure um uh to kind of help start you on the path to understanding what what some of the issues are and what that might mean this is a this is two maps um that are both portions of the state of Georgia where Georgia Tech is located southeast part of the United States the one on the left um is a map produced by um, a project of the state of Georgia, the Georgia, Georgia Broadband Deployment Map for 2021. And this is a map of fixed availability of fixed broadband access. Um, and the light yellow are regions that have no provider that provides fixed broadband access. And the orange is regions where there is at least one provider of fixed broadband access. And this is a county called Pike County. Um, uh, and I, I sort of don't need to tell you that there's a lot more light, light yellow or than, than there is orange in that picture. And you might, I don't know, ask yourself like, well, you know, I don't really, I'm not sure what the state of Georgia's geographic extent is, but maybe it's got some parts that are, you know, way out there. And so maybe that's why, uh, you know, the coverage looks like this. Well, this Pike County is not, um, Pike County is only about an hour and a half south of Atlanta. So the map on the right-hand side is really to give you the context for Pike County and show you um, without a scale, but trust me, it's an hour and a half away. I've driven it multiple times. Um, the distance between Atlanta and Pike County. And actually you're also seeing here, you know, that Atlanta and its immediately surrounding counties are extremely well covered. And then for whatever reason, immediately as you go south of, of Griffin, Peachtree City, you see this um, extreme drop off in coverage. So um, I want to I want to just posit that this is a, a really important problem and an interesting problem. Um, uh, it's actually a data problem and a coverage problem and a technology problem and a policy problem and an economic problem. Um, and, and, and let me just also say one more thing, which is I think that as a community, we have done a really good job embracing breadth um, in, in a couple directions. So data centers, which you might've thought were not, some might've thought were not networking, uh, are, are, are front and center in our, in our calls for papers and our, and our accepted papers. Uh, likewise, the physical layer um, is showing up in, in many, many papers. I've been reviewing for NSDI recently, um, but we seem to be reluctant to embrace um, moving kind of up the stack all the way up the stack to you know layer eight, um, uh, we embrace layer seven. Um, so uh, there's work for us to do, and and I hope some of the discussion in this panel will help move the community um, to an understanding and a and even would be great a, a, a bit more of an embrace of, um, of of layer eight work. So with that, um, I'm going to stop sharing and I'm going to. I'll switch over to the panel proper. So um, uh, let's see. Um, I'll I'll pick an arbitrary an or arbitrary order here. Um, Elizabeth, would you like to uh, briefly say something about a an example project you've been involved in? Sure. Thank you, Ellen. Um, 
Yeah, so I've, um, as Matt said, been working in wireless networking for about 21 years, um, 25, if you include PhD work. And about 12 years ago, I said that I wanted to do less just pure wireless networking um, and have it have a more human focus. Um, I sort of, I, I got uninspired by doing networking for the sake of networking and wanted to have more of an impact with my work. Um, and so upon realizing that more than at that point, more than half the world was still unconnected to the internet, I thought, okay, well, maybe that's something I can have an impact on. I can use my wireless skills um, in order to develop new technologies to get people in these really hard to reach places online. And part of what I learned by doing that is that, um, you know, a, a lot of people in different communities, they, they have maybe different desires or different ways that they want to use the internet and different um, sort of thoughts about it. And so we would do network measurement to understand in some communities how people were using the internet um, and how well the internet was performing. But as a networking researcher, we never really understood the why. So we would see what the performance was and what people were doing with the internet, but we never knew why. Why were they doing this? Um, you know, why, why did their traffic look different than in other communities? And it was really through realizing that there's much more nuance to it and needing to understand the human perspective that I realized I should actually be partnering with people who can, um, you know, figure out the why much more better, much more um, accurately than I can, which would be, um, in my case, social scientists or even humanists. Um, and so as a result, I've partnered a lot um, with individuals across campus and I think it's been really fruitful um, because we've been able to go into communities and really sort of understand their needs, um, how they might be using the internet or want to use the internet differently than you know, the, the mainstream of who the internet was designed for. And by knowing that we can do adaptations, we can make it work better for them. Um, and we can just sort of customize what we're doing to create a more positive experience. Um, so that's a lot of what um, we've spent the last 12 years doing is understanding network usage, um, understanding the why behind it, um, and then trying to innovate around better solutions to get people online, um, given perhaps unique circumstances of, of smaller communities that are, you know, not in urban centers. Thank you. Um, uh, I'm wondering if you might want to give an example of... Um, of, of a why or a nuance that um, that stands out from from the work that you've done. Sure. Um, so we've worked in um, all over. So I started internationally in rural Zambia um, and some other locations. And more recently, I work a lot with um, tribal Native American communities here in the U.S. Um, and one of the things we found um, in both locations, rural Zambia and here, is that. Um, people want to use social media just like everywhere else and there's a heavy predominance of wanting to access locally created content so photos of friends that are nearby posts of friends from nearby um, maybe you know community newspapers and so forth um, but if you're in a more rural community um, in the case of Zambia they were connected through a very slow um, satellite uplink. This was like 10 or 12 years ago, um, very slow connection. And all of this content was going up and down, up and down, up and down over the satellite link um, when it could have been shared locally. Um, but you know, the internet was architected for people who have fast connections um, and are physically close to content. And it just wasn't the case in the, these communities. Um, so we said, okay, well, maybe we can change things and just store a lot of this heavily accessed content locally. And then let's save that slow satellite link um, for content that, you know, doesn't generate from the community. But it was only really through looking at the traffic and talking to the people um, to, that we understood that. And then we could try to make things better for them. Thank you. Um, Adit. I do, it's, uh, this is a sort of good segue, I think, to, to some of your work in particular, um, uh, working and living in the global south. And I'm going to define that just because um, I suspect there are people on, uh, who've joined who don't, who don't know that term global south. Um, so, and, and I guess 
I'll apologize in advance if my this is my under my my working definition. Um, uh, talking about these terms, they're often a bit loaded, and so um, I'm 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 just giving. You can hear a little hesitation in my voice to want not to get it wrong. Um, so oh, great, great. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So for a long time, you know, we've used the terms um, uh, first world, third world, or developing developed world, developing world. Um, and, and both of those two uh, nomenclatures have a, uh, a sort of come with a, a sense of judgment, I think of a one is one is positive and one is negative. Um, global North and global South are terms that are um, uh, seem to be, uh, you know, gaining a lot of traction as, as a way to um, speak about uh, uh, different different settings, different um, circumstances, but without a kind of value judgment attached to the word. So global South um, actually doesn't even necessarily have to mean South of the equator often does, but, but doesn't have to. So, um, so working in the, living in the global South, um, you know, Elizabeth mentioned work in Zambia um, and then also work closer to uh, closer to home for her in in the Southwest. Um, um, uh, so it'd be great to hear about how your, where you are, uh, affects the work, the problems you choose and the work you do and, um, what kinds of methods, uh, you, you find are useful. This is actually, I'm giving you a sort of broad, broad range here. Uh, and, and then even going further, how do students, how, how do students get, get training in those methods and what, what, what can they learn in classes and what can really it can't really be fully learned without being in the field. So let me open that collection. Yeah, no, yeah, yeah, no, thanks, Ellen. And uh, yeah, great to be speaking to all of you. Um, uh, so yeah, so Ellen, what do you say about the Global North and the Global South? So um, a lot of the work, for example, that um, we've been doing has been uh, for development, for social development. Uh, sort of like what Elizabeth was mentioning also, how do we provide internet access and the example that you brought up. Um, um, so being in the global south in some sense makes us uh, closer, uh, brings us to, uh, closer to the action. And in some sense, we're able to understand the constraints under which we should build networks, uh, what sort of customization should we be thinking about for different performance uh, optimizations. Um, so, uh, so in that sense, it's it's interesting that we're being closer, we, we have a better sense of uh, how things and what are really the needs. Um, uh, but at the same time, I also add that actually the global north and global south distinction is, uh, I mean, in India, uh, India is one of the most unequal countries <laughs> as of today. So I mean, it's it's also within within the countries over here, and that's really something that impacts whatever work uh, we're doing. Uh, because uh, so I'm at IIT Delhi and sitting in Delhi um, and uh, IIT is sort of one of the most prestigious institutions, uh, really, really good students only are able to make it to IIT. Um, but, uh, but there is a big social distance with, so let's say if we want to set up networks in rural areas where most of us may never have actually visited, uh, even stepped out of urban cities. Um, so, uh, so that distance is still there even uh, when we talk about it and uh, uh, how to bridge this distance, I think that's really the key challenge. Um, it, it can't be done unless you visit the communities, unless, you, uh, unless you're there, you're understanding what are their needs. Um, uh, so, I mean, so for example, so, uh, we, uh, one of my first four days, which, uh, so by the way, you, you don't know, Keshav is my PhD advisor. Um, so, I mean, the journey really started with him and um, the very first project sort of that got me into this space was we were trying to provide low cost internet in rural areas um, uh, through delay tolerant networks. And, uh, but now what I'm doing, actually, there's no networks in it at all, because what we realized was that when people want to share information, uh, it's not really the internet, right? It's any, whatever local technology is available to them. So we've been using interactive voice response systems for that. Um, because everybody has uh, phones uh, or most of the people do have phones and it doesn't even require the internet and we're able to provide services through which they can they can call they can record information they can share this information with other people so um, and, and all this really comes when you're actually in the community so i think for students that's really the key part that 
not to be hesitant, right? Uh, it, it takes time. Um, it, it, methods, right? So of working closely with the community, understanding what their needs are, constraints, and then thinking about, well, do I even need to provide internet over here? Do I, or should I do, uh, should I use some other technology? So I think that can only come once they're actually there. And uh, um, so, yeah, so I, I think that's really the key point of uh, where, I mean, the, the human-centered part for me really sort of comes in actually being in touch with the humans who are, who are supposed to use the technologies that you're thinking about. Yeah. Yeah. Great. I, I'm, I'm, when I first started doing work in uh, what's called ICTD, which some of you know, but many of you may not know, information and communication technologies and development, meaning social, political, economic development, um, I actually did it not in networking. And, um, and so I sort of had a, a double hesitancy, um, uh, both moving to a, being working in an area that was outside of my uh, computer science comfort zone, and then also um, uh, uh, I was doing some work in Liberia, West Africa country of Liberia, and Gaetano Borello, who um, was a um, is a really uh, missed figure in uh, passed away, um, uh, told me that it, it, it the water's only cold when you first jump in, and um, that 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 phrase has really stuck with me, and I think it echoes your comment about you know don't be hesitant actually it's funny because there's a it's almost it's don't be hesitant but also you know don't be a jerk right like don't, don't think you know everything but don't think that because you know don't know a lot that you know that you sh that you can't uh you know learn and you can't you have to start that path at some point so um uh, absolutely yeah. yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, that's really the key thing. Uh, so for me, uh, whenever I, uh, I'm, I'm in the field, and even if I might just spend two days, what comes to our team and students is like three pages of emails yeah. about yeah. what I learned. <laughs> yes. So, uh, you know, uh, I, yeah, I, I drove, yeah, I drove down to, you know, to Pike County with a couple of my students um, recently. And, you know, we had zoomed with the folks there a couple times and, you know, that it, this, there's no substitute, you know, they drove us around and gave us a, a tour. Um, and um, yeah, you try to use your imagination, but, but, but it's a poor substitute. And plus in your imagination, you're only talking to yourself. Yeah. Um, so uh, uh, thank you. Um, uh, Curtis, I, um, I, I'm going to turn to you now. And I, I think it's, it's probably um, obvious to those who are watching our faces that you're the most uh, junior amongst us. Um, uh, and, and I think probably, uh, well, maybe this isn't completely true. Uh, I was going to say maybe the only one who sort of started in um, what might be called human human centered networking, or for me, I would call it I, I, I see a subset of ICTD. Um, that may not be true because the DTN work uh, for your thesis with Keisha may have also, you know, you may have that that work was very much also in in the space. But anyway, um, I, I wanted to ask you, you know, what's challenging about doing this work um, in general, and then and then maybe especially for a junior person, um, uh, you know, and that that. Uh, for those on the who are on the uh, watching the panel who are students, um, you know, may be quite helpful to them as I think about, you know, if I wanted to go take my work or in, in a direction like this, what, you know, what do I want to be aware of um, uh, in terms of being successful? Um, and I think that this is connected to a further question, which I might also open up for the rest of the panel when we get to that, which is, what do you wish that reviewers knew when they are looking at papers um, that folks like us are, are, are writing? So, Curtis. Sure. Um, yeah, so to start, just a little bit of kind of context on myself. I think, um, uh, you know, I don't know how uh, unique this is, but um, one element I think that sometimes I run into with other researchers is, I really come to this from um, this kind of work from a more of a political space in that uh, at the end of the day, what I'm doing is uh, like, I, I guess I, I started at the Rad Lab at, at UC Berkeley, which was like a good data center lab and sort of just didn't want to, like, I felt like Microsoft and Google had all the resources they needed to solve their problems. There were other problems that were problems I wanted to work on. And so essentially like trying to find people who, uh, 
are on the margins of the existing systems and trying to build things for them is kind of the worldview that I try to bring to the students in my lab. Um, and uh, you know th that is, I think, a ripe area. There's just always people kind of uh, left behind by uh, all the advances that are going on uh, and trying to re-architect things for them uh, and build things for them is a fun uh, Sisyphusian task uh, that will sort of always be there. Um, and uh, towards the kind of questions of being a, a junior person, I think that the largest struggle is really about community as a, as a junior student. Um, and I mean this in, in many, many senses. Uh, I think one element of trying to get a job like this, and I got super, super, super lucky, um, is when you, you know, you need champions inside of departments, you know, you need people who know what kind of work that you're doing. And essentially much of my human centered networking work actually goes to HCI venues. Uh, I would say most notably like of recent work, we have a CSCW paper on uh, um, doing a congestion management in a community network down in Mexico. Uh, and it's this really fun like Ostrom view of networks. And we didn't even try to shoot that to a networking venue. It just seemed uh, like it would never work. And so, you know, that's at CSCW, but uh, when that, packet arrives at a university is like they have no idea who this person is and my version of it is like even so I actually had to go through two faculty searches because it's hard life um, and uh, the first one I applied as a networking faculty member with my like hey I'm a networking person and it didn't get as many bites as I wanted so I switched and I was like oh I'm an HCI person and UW uh, you know bless them uh, literally just ignored my second packet they were like no you're not HCI, we're not gonna pretend that. And like, you know, we're just gonna pretend that you didn't do that. Uh, and you're gonna be a networking person. Um, and that was really great. And they really could do that because they had so much context on ICTD. This is one of the places that was really early. Uh, as Ellen mentioned, Gaetano was here. Uh, and so they knew me and they knew my work and they could kind of see the world that I was living in. Um, but it's hard otherwise. Uh, and I think trying to create a world for and a space for people like this who are in networking so that you know there's papers arriving at a SIGCOM or an NSDI or these kind of places um, that are considered in bounds uh, would be a boon for that. Because it's really hard to sit in the middle um, and you know, HCI people uh, are, are do work that's significantly different from mine. I think at the end of the day, I really am a networking person and I always get pulled back to more technical questions when, when I'm given the choice. Um, and so that's that's always a difficulty. And it's still a difficulty for what it's worth. I found that the problem is exacerbated at the funding level. Uh, the NSF is is a difficult space for this kind of work uh, in exactly the same way. These reviewers are uh, for sort of core networking people and uh, the HCI people can tell that the work I'm doing is, is more technical than, uh, than they would like. Um, but this is, I think, always the, the world of interdisciplinary researchers. It's just uh, it's sometimes difficult when the interdisciplinarity is like within a discipline, like uh, in computer science for the moment. Yeah, thanks, Curtis. That was, um, uh, that was really uh, um, thoughtful and, and, and I think, I hope, a bit provocative for those who um, who do review papers and review proposals. Um, I, I wanna open up, um, uh, Keshav will get his own question in, in a minute, but I, because we're on this particular topic, I wanted to open it up and see if others on the panel would like to contribute additionally um, to, or, or respond in any way you'd like to what Curtis has said. I guess I could add that, um, there's there's more challenges to it. Um, so, for instance, if you're working in a community, you know you you need to actually work in that community. You have to have a partner, a local partner on the ground, who is trusted um, and who can really help you. You know, make contacts and and do your work there. And the travel requirement is quite hard, um, which is part of why um, I turned my focus to communities in the U.S. was it was just much physically, much more, much easier to get there, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, but also because I hadn't even, you know, not, I had naively not realized that these problems exist within our borders as well. Um, but, but that's a hard component. And I, you know, along with what Curtis was saying, I think that's underappreciated in the community, you know, creating a solution and testing it in the lab, that's hard, but it's not that hard. 
Um, you know, we're networking researchers and that's what we do. Um, but creating a solution and testing it in the lab and then going out in the field and making it work and making it not screw things up for the lives of others, that's really hard um, because not only do you have to get the technical components right, but you have to have the social components right so that you're trusted and you can do this um, and you don't want to, you know, go in and screw things up and then leave and it falls apart. Um, and that's definitely something that I wish reviewers would appreciate. Um, you know, I, I remember one paper where we, um, I, I think it was our work in a refugee camp in Zatari in Jordan, and we went in and we um, collected ce cellular signal strength measurements to understand what the landscape looked like for cellular connectivity for these um, refugee camp ref um, residents. And based on our findings um, and some other nuances of the area, we, we created what we thought was a solution to get them better connectivity. Um, but we just tested it in the lab because it's a refugee camp. You know, you, you can't just walk into a refugee camp. Um, we had gotten permission the first time. Um, and a, a reviewer came back and said, well, why didn't you deploy it in the field? And that was just kind of absurd. Um, you know, you have to work with the UN and you, you don't just deploy a new technology in a refugee camp, you know? And so I, I think there's an underappreciation for just the amount of work and you, you kind of have to do it because you believe in it and, you know, you, you want to make this difference, um, but there's really a, a, a big step to getting these, these field tests and so forth um, that I just, you know, I would like people to think a little harder about when they're, you know, evaluating what, what has been done. Yeah, um, and anyone else on the panel want to jump in on, on riffing on these topics? I'll slightly just support Elizabeth's point, which has been, and in terms of venues like NSDI and the like, like uh, often my work gets shunted into the deployment or operations tracks because of this, because like a lot of the work is wrench turning and making friends. Um, and uh, it gets like, somehow that's the version of this that the networking community is, is like, okay with, um, and we're happy to get the paper in. Uh, so this, you know, is not a complaint, but that's a version of kind of what is going on. And I think centering some of that is, uh, would be nice, I suppose. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so just wanted to add that, uh, I mean, we do have other fantastic conferences now, right? ICTD, Dev, Compass. So, um, uh, I mean, uh, that's that's probably the home, uh, which is very valuable for nurturing all of this. Yeah, that's an important point that, you know, there, there are venues that have um, uh, uh, emerged in, in part to meet the needs for um, uh, places for interdisciplinary, including interdisciplinary and computer science work to happen. And uh, ICTD, the conference ICTD is a, um, a long running uh, version uh, uh, example. And there's a newer, newer um, conference called Compass. Thanks, Curtis, um, which was a reboot of ACM Dev. Um, I, I would say I, I, I value those venues a lot. Um, I, I still wish that I still would like our our kind of home conferences that you know we feel uh, you know the SIGCOMs and NSDIs to 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 be more open and embrace embrace some of this work. I think I think they are missing out, and I think that um, that it, it does pose some challenges um, uh, with respect to things like tenure and um, letter writers and things like this. I mean the things are growing, I'll, you know, you'll find out Curtis, after you get tenure, you'll get a lot of requests to write letters. Um, you know, there is a growing community and that's helpful. Um, uh, but, but that doesn't, um, yeah, I still, I still, you know, you want your, you want your home, you want to find a home in your, in your old home anyway. Um, even if there's some new, new places to go. Um, uh, there's a question um, that is very much in 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 along the lines of uh, responding to some of the things Elizabeth that you said about moving experimental studies from labs to the field and Curtis probably all of us could speak could speak to this but I'll, I'll, I'm going to go ahead and read that question. What do you see as the key challenges or barriers for moving experimental studies from labs to the field and communities and 
further supporting long-term longitudinal social economic research in addition to wireless and networking um, and thoughts on what might, what can or should be done to tackle those challenges and barriers? Great question. Elizabeth, you wanna, or Curtis, you wanna jump into that? <laughs> Everyone, um, yeah, um, kind of goes back to a little bit of what I said is that you really need the community partner. Um, if you don't have that, then it's a real challenge. Um, personally, I, I have found um, it easier to work closer to home because you can travel there more often and it keeps the travel costs down. And, you know, the worst thing that happens is if you go and you do a deployment and then something just needs to be rebooted and there's nobody there to do the reboot. Um, and so you have to go back or whatever. It's much easier to do that if it's not too far away. Um, but, you know, it, it does, it does pose additional challenges and, and time to invest in the communities. And so you have to do it because you want to do it. Um, you know, it, it's not, you can get a SIGCOM paper um, probably more easily without, without doing this, um, but you do it because you believe in it and because you wanna make a difference. Um, so for instance, when I look for students um, to join my lab, <clears throat> I look for students who not only are interested in networking, but who are interested in social good and who want to make a difference um, because it is a harder road to you know, take the time to do things in the field. Um, but you know, it, it's, it's what matters at least you know, to me and to my group and is making a difference to other people. But it's really, those community partners are just invaluable because unless you're living in the community, you just can't be there all the time um, and you have to have that. Curtis, you want to add anything? Sure. I, I think partially the answer is a reorganization of kind of the order of operations here in that, um, you know, the, there is a body of human-centered methods. Like the, the title of this uh, panel is not chosen by accident and it comes from a long literature of just reaction research um, and, and other spaces where you don't build things in the lab and take them to the field and sustain. What you do is you engage deeply with partners and start to design things iteratively in, in collaboration with those people in those places. This is speaking a little bit to what Elizabeth is saying. This is really hard. Uh, my, my grad work was like me living in, in Indonesia for like six months, building out this fun network. And it's like a really fantastic way to do this research because it like embeds all of the technology innovation into the systems surrounding them. And that network has sustained, uh, like even throughout, it's, it's, we're, we're approaching a decade of, of this thing uh, existing there. Um, and so that's hard because those initial steps are exactly not what networking researchers consider research. It's this like whiz bang thing that happens at the end. Um, and so if you build your whiz bang thing and throw it into the community, there'll be this like impedance mismatch and things don't work as well. Um, so yeah, I think the, that's my answer to that is to, to upend the methods. But again, it's so hard to do that. It is an enormous amount of work. And when you actually talk to social scientists, like an anthropologist, like they spend their first three years just like learning a language. Like their, their, their lenses are so much broader um, in, in time and, and what a contribution is. A, an econ student, for instance, publishes like one paper uh, and, and comes out. And so th there's a lot of impedance match mismatches throughout the, the ecosystem that make this difficult. But that's, I think, the best answer I've come up with. Yeah, thanks, Curtis. All right, Keshev, um, uh, 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 the, the question we uh, set aside for you was, um, which project was most rewarding for you in the human centered networking space? And what current project are you most excited about? Plus, you may take the liberty to... Um, define uh, human-centered networking. Uh, thanks, Evan. Um, yeah, so uh, I, I just want to say that uh, I've been, do, I did networking for many years, uh, starting from 1988, I guess, and uh, uh, many decades. And so SICOM was my home. I'm now a recovering networking person. So <laughs> I'm not publishing in, in these venues at all. And in fact, we've created a new SIG, SIG Energy. So what is human-centered? To me, human-centered means caring about humanity, 
And at the moment, as all of you probably realize from COP26, the biggest challenge facing humanity is not uh, the lack of connectivity in some parts of the world, it's the lack of a future for the whole of humanity. You know, it seems to me that human-centric networking ought to take into account this challenge. And if you don't take this into cha challenge into account, all the best technology in the world, best networking technology in the world is not going to be sufficient to protect us from the fires and the floods and the typhoons and all the other horrible things that are going to happen to all of us. So number one, human-centric that does not include climate change is basically bogus, in my opinion, I, just to be mild and you know non-controversial. Uh, the second part of it is what is networking? And I've spent many years thinking about it. And I think that networking, of course, is about communication and about being able to interact. But I believe that studying networking and understanding it gives us what I would call networking superpowers, you know, techniques. And one of them, of course, is, you know, we, we have some mathematical foundations, you know, optimization, queuing theory, control theory, signal processing, things like that. We understand systems with multiple temporal scales, you know, that from the nanosecond to the multi-decades, uh, spatial scaling, uh, capacity scaling in terms of, you know, where you go bit rates to ter you know, terabits per second, uh, and decompose decomposing a system with, with strict APIs. So the protocols are nothing more than APIs between component systems. And more recently, we've been looking at using, you know, big data analysis, uh, hardware software co-design, these are all very important skills. And so what I've been doing for the last decade really is to try and use these skills in other venues. So the first thing that uh, I've been looking, I, I looked at or spent a decade was on energy systems. So solar PV, electric vehicles, uh, heating, ventilation, air conditioning, very boring, but it's actually networking the sense that you have flows of heat or flows of cold air going through buildings. So many of these kinds of technologies and the techniques that we use to think about come, come through. So I, let me give two very practical examples. So I say one practical example and one current thing I'm working on is, which follow from this. So the practical thing that I did is, you know, we, about eight years ago, my group, we got interested in how many solar panels should you buy to put in a rooftop? How much storage should you buy? It's a very simple question. You know, you say, okay, I have some roof space. I want to put some panels out in storage. And if you ask, somebody in the industry, how much, how many panels to buy, they'll just say, how much money do you have? You know, the more money you have, buy more. You know, that's basically it. You go to Tesla and Elon Musk would say, you know, open your wallet, you know, take, take all your money. Obviously, that's the right thing for them to say. But if you think about it from a mathematical or computer uh, networking perspective, you can think of the flow of electrons from PV as being a stochastic source of data, just like a source of electrons, if you will, similar to a source of data. You can view a storage as a buffer, electrical storage as a buffer, and then your load as being a output of that buffer. So you can convert a solar storage load system into a source buffer and sync system. And then what you have is you have a stochastic input and stochastic output, and you can model those using stochastic uh, approaches, such as stochastic network calculus. And then what you do is you size the buffer so that you don't have an underflow or an overflow. So if you have an underflow, it means you turn your light switch on, no light comes out. Well, that's an underflow. An overflow means you have to turn off your solar panel because you can't store the excess that you created. So both underflows and overflows are bad. And a series of papers going back, uh, as I said, about eight years now, we've been using essentially stochastic network analysis to size solar and storage. And it's not an easy problem. It gets very complicated, it's doubly stochastic. And also you're predicting what your load is going to be for the next 25 years, not 25 milliseconds, but 25 years. And you have to predict what your generation is going to be for the next 25 years as well. And storage is not a perfect, it's not perfect like a memory is. You can't, you, what the bits you put in are not the bits you get out. What you, what you put in is limited. So modeling storage, you, taking into account electrochemical uh, limitations turns out to be quite complicated. So we spent three, four years looking at working with electrochemists on how do you model storage appropriately. So there's actually a non-trivial amount of work. So that's the work that I want to sort of mention. And why, why is this important from the perspective of climate change? Because if you have solar and you have storage, you're not on the grid anymore. And you have clean electricity essentially forever. And uh, it builds re resilience in case you have actually got a storm going on, you know, as some people in California discovered, anybody had stored their lights on, everybody else that didn't have the lights on. 
And secondly, uh, by not using uh, fossil fuel based generation, you're reducing the amount of carbon dioxide going into the atmosphere dramatically. So that's an example of uh, what I call human centric networking, if I redefine the terms. Um, I want to talk very briefly about the current work I'm doing, which is uh, pushing the border even a little bit further, which is to come up with trustworthy carbon credits. And so to many of you, when you fly, there'll be this button that says, pay $5, you'll offset your carbon. Do you believe in those credits? The answer is probably no. And, the, and uh, for very good reasons, uh, especially most of these are for uh, reforestation or prevented deforestation kind of uh, principles. And uh, we have no idea if these forests exist, if they've been sold over and over again, uh, will they continue to exist you know, when the project ends and so on. So I've been working with zoologists and plant scientists and forest scientists to use earth observation, uh, big data processing from these earth observations, because actually from the International Space Station, we're actually getting uh, petabytes of data from lasers which go down to the earth and come back up again and measure the height of the of what was underneath it. Um, from that, we can extract uh, carbon densities. And then from that, we can actually come up with uh, basically um, uh, believable carbon credits. We're putting all of that in a, in a, in a blockchain, which is not Bitcoin, it's, uh, it's energy efficient blockchain. So you're combining essentially earth observation, uh, data analysis, AI, um, and blockchain and, and a market design to solve this problem. And we just started the Cambridge Center for Carbon Credits uh, about a month ago. And uh, we believe that it can actually uh, change uh, the behavior of, of people who are willing to do offsets in, in, in a major way. So any, I'll stop with that. Uh, uh, reactions from the rest of the panel, comments, questions uh, to Keshav's um, re redefinitions? Nothing really on the redefinitions. I just wanted to sort of support the, the area. Uh, notably, there, there are I would say particularly pessimistic uh, views of this in some communities that like pessimistic being like things aren't going to get that much better. Uh, and Limits is a wonderful workshop venue for talking about how to actually pull back some of uh, the, the outputs or inputs, I guess, even uh, of computation that uh, Baroth at USC has been doing for a while. So I just wanted to sort of call, shout out that because I think it's a great initiative that uh, is a very interesting space. Yeah, some some work in that vein also shows up at Compass. Um, uh, so uh, to you know, an, a, a, another place to either look or or contribute work. Um, and and I think the caring about humanity uh, sort of a, a probably is a is a redefinition or definition that underlies a lot of um, what the rest of us would also you know also uh, subscribe to and and is part of what has drawn us. Um, to the kinds of problems that that we're working on. Um, so uh, yeah, so 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 thank you. Um, there's a question um, from an attendee, which is um, uh, ha, ha, and it's a good it's a good one to as we're getting closer to the end, which is how do you, how do you see the field evolving? What kind of progress from research or overall movement building would you like to see happen in the next five to ten years? What kind of progress do you think is required to get us there? Who'd like to grab that one? Uh, I guess I could uh, take a shot and uh, also just to also respond to Keshav uh, because we always uh, love to uh, challenge each other on many of these things. So um, uh, uh, I, Curtis initially mentioned this very important term uh, of uh, right being uh, coming from a political standpoint. So I think that's very very essential because uh, right doing good for humanity itself can be thought about in so many ways, uh, and there's different methods right. So Curtis talked about right being in the community, innovating, building stuff with them. So uh, so there's less chances of sort of doing harm. Uh, because uh, well, you, well, you sort of understand the depths much better. Um, uh, so, uh, so I think that lens is very important uh, because, um, right? Who is the? Who, who, how will these innovations impact different communities around the world? Um, uh, right? I think that perspective becomes important, and to get that, you really need to be in the communities to sort of 
think about it um because uh, uh, so there's also uh, i'm sure all of us would be familiar with all the movements around environmental justice and um whether is it is it good enough to sort of substitute fossil fuel with solar panels versus actually investing right uh, in in the global south on um, providing cleaner fuel uh, and i mean some of the big criticisms around cop uh, this year have also been that it's it's not right the funding going to the global south on uh, adapting to climate change and all of that is very limited so i think those perspectives are very valuable that ultimately right whatever technologies we're building um, how is it going to affect uh, who is it going to benefit more who is it going to benefit less and ultimately is it geared towards making the world a more equal place mm -hmm. so if that is the political uh, stance or ideology of sort of a global equality that we're coming towards then i think the problem definition needs ne needs to come from a different perspective okay thank you yeah, I, I, um, you know, I, I, the, the, there's a lot of complex interaction between um, uh, climate change and 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 inequality, right? Um, and uh, you know, who, who, who's, who's been responsible for um, the the negative things that have been happening in the in climate, and then who will be responsible for um, doing better going forward, um, and and it it produces complex um, intertwined uh, questions, for sure. Um, and and I I also liked Curtis's in, invocation of a political standpoint um, uh, as a as a driver for doing the work. I you know I'm my, I'm I'm newer to well the the sustainability in the in the broad and common sense that it's now viewed, which is a combination of environmental, social, and economic sustainability, um, uh, it, it is newer to me than networking by a long shot. Um, uh, uh, but, I, but I do think that the um, thinking about the future and the future for all uh, does underlie, um, uh, you know, both the work Hesh have talked about, and also I think what many of us view ourselves as doing, um, uh, and 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 a commonality, perhaps a commonality is working with communities and how do community? What does it mean to have a sustainable community? How do communities become economically and um, and socially sustainable, meaning, you know, thriving in, in all senses of the word. So um, I think, I think that's, it's not as, as out there um, as, uh, as, as you might've thought. Um, uh, so what's the difference between human-centered networking and user-centered centric networking? What steps should be take, given to truly create infrastructures that can autonomously adapt in a sustainable way, support intermittent connectivity, we have different technological blocks, virtualization, programmability. What about interdisciplinary work? All right, that's a that's a broad set of questions. Um, uh, you know, I, I think it's a it, it's 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 a I would call it a grand challenge to have infrastructures that can autonomously adapt in a sustainable way. Um, uh, and we you know we. I guess several of us here went through the the, the time period of working on disruption tolerant networks, um, which which to be honest only was I would say slightly grudgingly accepted in the networking community, um, the the mainstream networking community, if if that. Um, but that I think has as uh, in some way sh showing it's showing it's um, uh, being ahead of its of its time. Um, I, I, I'm going to read. So, so, okay. So there's a question that is around differences between human centered and user centric. If there are any, I'm not sure there are any that to my mind that are, that are, um, make things very different. Um, uh, and then there's a question for Keshav about, um, whether sm what smart grids and peer-to-peer -peer energy systems. Let me um, just answer that offline. I yeah. Think. Okay. Okay. Cool. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we are really getting very close to the end. Um, 
Keisha, uh, Curtis, did you say that we didn't answer one of these questions? That's probably right. Do you want to pick it yeah, up? I don't think we really got to how the field's evolving. Yeah, question. please. Can you, do you want to? Um, so I guess this is, these, these things are so hard with the Q&A structure to know exactly because the immediate response is like, which field are you talking about? I'll say to my immediate response to that is I think what's evolving is networking. Um, and sort of a realization, even uh, again, I'm in like junior faculty life. So the NSF is uh, on my shoulder all the time, but you know, there's a big motion there to uh, do better uh, broadening participation in computing elements, right? And so as networking researchers, you suddenly have to start worrying about equity issues that you hadn't had to worry about before. Similarly, um, I'm on the NSDI PC and there's like an IRB discussion. Um, which is, I think, you know, fascinating in this way. And you're gonna see more and more of these things because uh, I think this, the, the space had been pulled so far by the Googles and Microsofts and data centers and all these kind of things. Um, there is a, a sort of a movement a, a, away from that or back from that. And I think there's always gonna be space uh, for that kind of work, obviously it's, a, it's, it's central, um, but uh, a desire for, for, for work outside of that. And then you can see these little nuggets of human center elements coming in and needing to understand um, and evaluate and appreciate all of that work as it starts to go. And I think this is really just about computer science in general. We're not really in a position where we can sit uh, in the ivory tower talking about TCP all the time um, and uh, not really talk about these other issues. I think the whole field and really uh, academia and the, just a lot of the world is certainly having to center some of these discussions, which is something I appreciate uh, but that's something that uh, the field uh, will have to work its way through. Um, and I'm actually, I think it's a really difficult problem because networking as a community is actually extremely diverse um, and it comes with a lot of backgrounds and a lot of different political ideologies and all these kind of things where I think there will be uh, interesting discussions to have in the future uh, in the next couple of years as this, this process uh, happens. I guess I'd add one thing that I think, um, you know, uh, the ways that COVID revealed how um, incredibly challenging it is not to have connectivity um, uh, to many, many people who or, or made it visible to people who probably had had no, you know, no reason to pay attention and maybe even very little opportunity to have had that revealed to them. Um, and, you know, the, that county in Georgia, um, when the schools closed, you know, those kids basically didn't go to school. They, they online, online school was not an option. And I, of course, this is true in other parts of the world and has been for a long time. I'm only highlighting that because I, I know it very firsthand. So um, I, I hope that, and, and, and really, I think Keshev has also highlighted, you know, there's really serious things happening in the world. And um, uh, making a little more money for Google is, is, is one path to go, but there, there's other paths and, um, and, and we, are, we are finite resources, right? Our attention and our time and our, the way we direct our students. Um, and I think uh, the last few years have really called that into sharp relief. Keisha, if you want to have a last word, Matt needs to say something for one minute, so you can have one minute. Okay, I'll keep it very short. I mean, in terms of human-centered networking, or if I can redefine it, you know, applying networking for solving human problems, the best source of problems turns out to be the daily newspaper. You know, we don't need to go read prior sitcom to see what problem to solve. The papers are full of problems. If you can solve any one of them, you'd be a hero. So try solving any one of the problems in front page, whatever appeals to you, and that would be a good way of doing human-centered networking. Because the papers are not about technology, they're talking about people. Thank you. If you could stand to read the paper, I have to say, I had to set it aside for a few years there. Um, uh, Matt, would you like to have the last word? And, and also to highlight, some of us will go onto the Slack channel, be on the Slack channel after for a little bit. So um, go ahead, Matt. Yeah, I, I, was, I was just gonna, uh, you know, we'd, we'd all like to th thank the panel. That was amazing. Uh, for, thank you for the very uh, interesting and eye-opening panel. Um, and we wanna keep the discussion going. Like Ellen said, if y'all could get on the Slack and discuss, any questions are fine. The panel's, you know, very excited to interact with you. and exchange ideas and how you can you, you know, yourself work in this very uh, interesting and very impactful area. 
Um, regarding the networking channel, we'd like also like to ask you to keep an eye on the webpage for further announcements. We're going to be posting the new season of talks in the coming weeks, and we hope very much you will join us for an exciting spring offering of talks. Uh, thank you all very much. Yes, let me add my thanks to the panel and to, to all in the audience. And um, Matt, thank you for being our, um, our shepherd. Uh, I, I will head over to the um, Slack channel and hope to see some of you there. Bye. Bye-bye. Thank, Thank you. Bye, everyone.